This presentation is a part of a lecture series on the C++ programming language by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. For those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given at the bottom of this slide. In this section, I'm going to talk about a few miscellaneous aspects of classes that haven't yet been discussed. As discussed earlier, there are certain special member functions of a class that if you don't provide these member functions, the compiler may, under certain circumstances, provide these functions for you automatically. And these special member functions include the default constructor, the copy and move constructors, the destructor, and the copy and move assignment operators. So what happens if you have a situation where you don't want to provide one of these functions at all? This can cause some problems because if you don't provide the functions at all, then the compiler may automatically generate them for you. And an example where you might want to do this is what's shown on the slide here, the code example. We have this class called thing, and what we want to do is we want thing to be movable but not copyable. So we want objects of type thing to be able to be moved but not be able to be copied. The obvious solution to this problem is if we don't want the objects to be copied, then we just don't provide a copy constructor and we don't provide a copy assignment operator. Because if we don't provide a copy constructor and we don't provide a copy assignment operator, there's no way that objects can be copied because these are the functions that perform copy operations. However, if we don't provide these functions, this doesn't really solve the problem because if we don't provide a copy constructor and copy assignment operator, then the compiler will happily provide them for us automatically. And this is not what we want. But there is a very nice solution to this problem. What we can do is we can use what's called a deleted special member function. So we have our declarations for the copy constructor here and the copy assignment operator. And you'll notice what we've done here. After the declaration of the copy constructor, we say delete equals delete. And basically what this says is it says that we're not going to provide this function and furthermore, we don't want the compiler to automatically generate this function either. And we could do a similar thing for the assi copy assignment operator here. We say equals delete, which says we're not providing this function. We don't want the compiler to provide it automatically either. And when we do this, this will prevent copying for this class because it guarantees that there will not be any copy constructor or copy assignment operator for the class. Sometimes you may want to explicitly indicate that you want to use the default behavior for one of these special member functions. For example, maybe for this class we want to provide a default constructor and we want the default constructor to have the default behavior that the automatically provided default constructor would have if the compiler provided it for us. What we can do is instead of writing that function ourselves, we can just say, write the declaration and say equals default. And what this will do is the compiler will provide the automatically generated default constructor that it would normally provide by, by default. And we could do this with other functions, special member functions, for example, with the move constructor, move assignment operator, and so on. Sometimes we may want to have a data member for a class that's shared by all objects of the class instead of having that data member appear in every single object of the class. And fortunately, there is a way to accomplish this in C++ with what's called a static data member. So a static data member is simply a data member that there is only one instance of the data member that's shared by all objects of the class. And to make a data member static, you declare it using the static qualifier. And static data members must be defined, in most cases, outside the body of the class. So I have a code example below to illustrate the use of static data members. We have this class called Widget. And basically what we want to do is we want to keep track of how many widget objects are in existence at any particular point in time in the program. So what we want is a single counter that's shared by all of the objects of class Widget, which is called count underscore, which is going to track how many uh, widget objects are currently in existence that have been created but not yet destroyed. So to do this, we don't want this count object or this count data member to appear in every single object. We just want the single one that's shared by all objects. So we make it a static data member by putting the static, static keyword here. And you'll notice that basically what we're doing in the constructors and destructors for the, the uh, class is every time we construct an object, we increment this count because now there's one more widget in existence. And then every time a widget is destroyed, we decrement the count. So essentially this counter, is which is initialized to zero down below here, every time we create a widget, the counter will get incremented. Every time we destroy a widget, the object that this counter will get decremented. So at any given point in time, we can query how many objects there are in existence of the widget type by looking at this counter called count underscore. And here we have the definition of the actual uh, 
data member. So because it's defined outside of the class body, we need the scope resolution operator. And we have to explicitly say it's, it's the, the count underscore data member that belongs to the widget class. And then we just say it equals zero to initialize it to zero. Sometimes we may want to have a member function of a class that does not operate on any object of the class. In other words, we want a member function that doesn't have any this variable associated with it. In C++, we can do this with what's called a static member function. And to make a member function static, we declare it using the static qualifier. And I have a code example below to help illustrate the use of static member functions. So we have this class called widget. And it has some, a whole bunch of code in it denoted by the dot, dot, dots here. What it's doing is not important, except for the fact, for some reason, this widget class has the need to frequently convert from degrees to radians. It's doing this all over the place in the code. And because of this, we want to put the function that does the conversion from degrees to radians actually in the class, because it's kind of a core and fundamental part of the class. But this conversion from degrees to radians, it doesn't really make sense to make this function deg to rad a, a regular member function, in other words, a non-static member function, because this to do its job, this function doesn't need to access the this variable. It doesn't need to access the non-static data members of the class. So what we do is we make this function a static member function by putting the keyword static here, which means that this particular member function doesn't operate on any class object. There is no this variable associated with this member function. And then down below, I have some code that uses this member function. There's a function called func. I declare two local variables, a widget called x and then a double variable called rad. And then I'm going to invoke the degree to radian conversion function, deg to rad, from the widget class. In other words, I'm going to invoke this function here, and I want to pass it the value 45. So I want to convert 45 from degrees to radians. One syntax I can use to, to invoke the function is to say widget colon colon deg to rad. So I'm basically fully specifying the name of the function by specifying the class name and then the scope resolution operator and then the name of the member in the class, which is deg to rad. There's another way that I can do this. I could also, if I have a, a variable of the type widget just hanging around, and in this case I do, I have a widget called x, I can say x and then use the member selection operator dot and then say the name of the member function deg to rad. And this will achieve the same thing as the line above. It will invoke the deg to rad member function. This might seem a little bit weird though to you because if you understand what a static member function is, the whole point of a static member function is it doesn't operate on any class object. And this might seem a little bit weird because you're giving it a class object x. So what's the deal here? The deal is x is ignored. In other words, even though you're giving it a, a, an object of class widget, because the member function that you're invoking, deg to rad, is a static member function, it ignores x. It never uses it. You might wonder why this syntax is allowed. Probably it's just for convenience because sometimes this syntax is less typing than typing out a fully qualified name um, for the, the member function, specifying the class and then the scope resolution operator and the name of the member function. At this point, I want to talk a little bit about I.O. and in particular stream inserters. Stream inserters are used to write data to an output stream and they accomplish this by overloading the operator less than less than. And the general form of an output operator is as follows. You're, again, you're overloading operator less than, less than. It takes two parameters. One is an L value reference to an O stream. In other words, the output stream that you want to output the data to. And the second parameter is the actual data that you want to output, where T typically denotes a const L value reference type. So it's usually an, an L value reference, a reference for efficiency, because the thing that you're printing could be quite large, so you don't really want to copy it. You can pass it by reference. And the const is for const correctness, because if you're passing by reference, the output operator shouldn't change the thing that it's outputting. Therefore, it should be a constant reference. An example of uh, an output operator would be for the uh, simple complex number type. I'm not going to show the full definition of the complex number type here, but it provides a member function called real, which gets the real part of the complex number, and a, and a member function called imag, which returns the imaginary part of the complex number. And then what we want to do is print the complex number to an output stream. So we overload operator less than, less than. The first parameter to the function is an L value reference to an O stream, which is the output stream that we want to send the data to, which is going to be called out stream inside the function. And the second parameter is the data that we want to output, which in this case is a complex number of some type that we've developed. And the parameter is called A. Again, it's passed as a constant reference. The reference is for efficiency. 
and const is for const correctness. If we look at the function, all it's doing is it's just sending to the output stream the real part of A, followed by a space, followed by the imaginary part of A. And then it returns a reference to the output stream. And one comment I should make about stream inserters and stream extractors, inserters basically do output, extractors do input. Inserters and extractors should use compatible formats. So whatever is written by a stream inserter should be able to be readable by the corresponding stream extractor. Having talked about stream inserters, now I'd like to talk about stream extractors. Stream extractors read data from an input stream, and they accomplish this by overloading operator greater than, greater than. And a stream extractor has the general form that's shown here. Again, you're overloading operator greater than, greater than. And there are two operands, which correspond to the two parameters here. The first is a ref L value reference to an I stream or input stream, which is the stream that the data is going to be read from. The second parameter corresponds to the value that's being read, where it should be written to. This is typically going to be some kind of reference type, and it's going to be a non-const reference type so that you can actually modify the value in order to pass it back to the caller. I have a ex simple example of a stream extractor here. This is for some complex number type. The full definition of the type is not shown here, but it's not really so important. Um, but the complex number type has a constructor that takes two parameters, the real part and the imaginary part of the complex number, which is what we're using in this function here. So if you look at the stream extractor, it has two parameters. The first is an L value reference to an I stream, which is the input stream that the data is going to be read from. And the corresponding parameter is called in stream. And the second parameter is the data that's going to be read. It's a, and it's a reference parameter because this data needs to get some way, in some way passed back to the caller. So a reference parameter would be a reasonable way to do this. Inside the function, we have the two local variables, real and imag, which are initialized to zero. Then we read from the input stream the real part and the imaginary part of the complex number. Then we create a complex number with that real part and imaginary part and assign it to A, which is the parameter that's passed by reference. So in effect, this line here is giving back to the caller the value that we've just read. And then it returns a reference to the input stream. 